design detection. The question that I'll raise at the beginning is, can design be detected in the universe outside of the work of modern humans and their products such as computers and some other animals such as beavers and honeybees? The answer of the ID movement is yes, and that is precisely the question that distinguishes ID from theistic evolution, or at least the modern variant of theistic evolution. But the question has been raised, how do we detect design? Or can design be, detection be, even be done re, re, reliably? If the answer to that is no, then the answer to the first question I raised is obviously no also. So is design actually detectable? Well, I created a post for Uncommon Descent, which uh, attempted to answer that question. Uncommon Descent was started by William Dembski, continued by Denise O'Leary, and currently run by Barry Harrington. Uh, William Dembski, most of you should recognize as a, uh, a founder of uh, uh, the intelligent design movement. It has one post with over 216,000 views. And uh, in fact, that was several days ago, so it's probably more than that now. Um, so it's not an insignificant blog. As we see, we'll find people who, who uh, are at least somewhat prominent in the uh, design fighting movement that react to intel uh, uncommon dissent. A guest post was post called Design Detection. Um, and uh, it was posted by Barry Arrington, who runs the thing under Intelligent Design. And it said, Paul Geem provides the following guest post today. The following three pictures were made to represent trays with 560 coins with either white heads or black tails showing. At least one of them was created by shaking coins and then spreading them out on a table, actually multiple shakes of 20 or so coins, and copying the pattern of heads and tails produced. Which one or ones are they and why? Were the ones, if any, that were not done by this process designed, and if so, by whom? and using what method? Here are the pictures. One, two, three. Does anybody detect design there? And that's the question. Now, this actually has a background. If you're discussing design, you can point to such things as Mount Rushmore, which uh, uh, obviously has design in the center. But the question is, how do you quantify that? Can you put numbers to this? Well, you really can't for Mount Rushmore easily. Um, what do you do with 500 heads? 500 coins all laying there with heads up. Why 500? Because there are 10 to the 80th particles and 10 to the 45th Planck times per second and 10 to the 25th seconds in a billion times the assumed life age for Earth, uh, age for the universe. So basically, if you turned every particle into a coin flipping machine. And you had them flip for uh, the lifetime of the universe, it would be a billion to one odds that you would get to 10, uh, uh, against that you would get to 10 to the 150th power. And 10 to the 150th power is 2 to the 498.34 power, which is approximately 2 to the 500th power. So that's why 500 heads or tails, 2 to the 500th power. And then there is finally to be or not to be, which is an interesting story in and of itself, and we'll get to that. So let's look at the 500 coins. The first uh, blog post that I can find that... Uh, uh, specifically uses 500 coins in this way uh, is there and then there are some memorable exchanges perhaps the most memorable one 
uh, is a statistical question for Nick Matsky. That's the title, of course. And the question, and it's very simple, if you came across a table on which was set 500 coins, no tossing involved, and all 500 coins displayed the head side of the coin, would you reject chance as a hypothesis to explain this particular configuration of coins on a table? That's the question. Now, shortly into the comments, Mark Frank comments, chance is meaninglessly vague as a hypothesis, as is design. I would reject the hypothesis that someone had independently tossed each coin and each coin was fair. There are many other plausible mechanisms which are far more likely to produce that configuration. Some of these involve intelligence. Someone placed them that way. Some of them do not. For example, they might have slid out of a packet of coins without a chance to turn over. Okay, and Nick Madsky immediately comments and says what Mark said. <laughs> and then he said, another hypothesis is that all the coins have heads on both sides. <laughs> In other words, it's not and then S. Thing. Cordova comes back and said what Mark said. Mark didn't get answer the question with a simple yes or no. Is this the sort of answer you give to your students if they pose the question to you? The question was, what, would you reject chance as a hypothesis for explaining the configuration? Two-headed coins is a rejection of the chance hypothesis. Sliding out of a coin wrapper in the original configuration is a rejection of the chance hypothesis. Having a robot mechanically order them is a rejection of the chance hypothesis. Having some space, intelligent space alien, sorry, that's the way he wrote it, configure them is a rejection of the chance hypothesis. You'd almost never hear of such silly evasions in the discussion of simple statistics. You can't find it in yourself, Dr. Matsky, to say, yes, I would reject chance as in some sort of random process as an explanation. You'd stress irrelevancy, start talking about anything rather than say yes. <coughs> so Nick Matsky comes back. You'll notice I'm skipping numbers. There are the people who are saying, Two-headed coins is a rejection of the chance hypothesis. Not really. Under this hypothesis, the arrangement of the sides of the coins are all random. It's just the thing where scoring heads happens to be found in both sides of the coin. You seem frustrated by our responses. What you aren't getting is that, and this is his own bolding, probability calculations depend on the model that you assume for the process generating the outcomes. Okay. So we'll come back to 63, S. Cordova, as you imagine, there's a lot of other conversation happening. Uh, stay, that's why we secretly keep, keep Nick on the payroll here at UD. One gobsmacking imbecilic blithering after another from a nationally prominent Darwinist. He's worth his weight in gold to the ID movement, and he works for peanuts. Oh, brother, help. <laughs> we could milk it more by asking, Nick, Sal said that a two-headed coin would preclude chance as a mechanism even in principle with respect to a 500 all-heads coin pattern. You disagreed and said not really. Can you elaborate further how there is a chance tails could emerge as an outcome with a two-headed coin since you insist chance can still have a role in the final outcome? <laughs> It's no longer merely about materialist fighting ID. It's about saving face at all costs. I think there's one other thing. It's about fighting ID at all costs. But Jeffrey Shallot got into the act, and uh, there's uh, Shallot's a somewhat well-known uh, person in uh, uh, the uh, academic world. Um, and uh, I had some comments, and I'll go over some of them. Um, the really sad part is that Nick Mansky could have avoided all this by simply allowing truth to be a guide rather than simply opposing ID on principle. I've seen where, by recognizing that his opponents might have, have some points, listening and responding as directly as possible to those points, he can make a worthwhile contribution. Perhaps there's a lesson in there for all of us. Never get so caught up in opposition that you fail to recognize when your opponent has a point. 
Truth is more important than winning. That is hard on all of our egos. We might have to admit we were at least partially wrong. It also means that we might have to surrender the typical argument that our opponent has made a mistake and has therefore lost all credibility. People make mistakes all the time. What is important is whether the core argument is valid and sound. Mark Frank comes back. The really sad part is that Nick Madsky could have avoided, he's quoting me of course. Uh, and then he goes on to say, this principle should guide us all. But why do you assume that Nick was not guided by what he sees as the truth? There's been an outbreak here of assuming that what you say is so obviously true that anyone who is disagreeing with you must be doing so insincerely. Nick, myself, Lizzie, and many others on TSZ all sincerely believe it is wrong to think that chance as a simple abstract con uh, concept can be a hypothesis. We've given reasons for it. We've tried to seek common ground by offering more precise definitions. What more do you expect? Barry, or any of you could have avoided all this by responding to my request, repeated many times, by chance do you mean a 50% probability of each coin's being heads or tails independent of other coins? It is not as if Barry answered no. What I mean is, he just avoided answering the question, as far as I can see. There have been a lot of comments flying about in many threads. And then I responded, Mark Frank, I know you've officially left this thread. It, no, 137, he said it was time to stop. That's obviously not an original. And therefore, will not expect an answer. But it is still proper to answer your comment in 19. You quote me, and then say, the principle should guide us all, but why do you assume, etc. cetera. Um, I hope Nick is being simply contrarian, close to insincere, but not quite, when he made the comment, uh, two-headed coins is a rejection of the chance hypothesis. Not really. When events have a probability of one, and these coins are specified as lying down and not on their edge, we commonly no longer speak of chance, but of law. The fact that there could be, these could also be carefully arranged coins, a chance component in how they land is effectively canceled out by the fact that both sides are heads. Chance has no role in whether a head is showing for each coin, and therefore for the whole ensemble. To put it another way, there is no chance that the coins could land any other way but heads. If we had five multillion coins dumped out of a dump truck and they were all two-headed coins, we should expect to see all heads and no tails, again excluding coins on their edge. To claim that chance has any role in the final outcome of all heads is to twist words beyond recognition. Matsky was wrong. Do, are you dis really disputing this? Just to clarify, I am, not, I am specifically not saying that Matsky is always wrong or that he should not be listened to. I'm just saying that he blew it here. And then quoting uh, Mark Frank again, myself, Lizzie, sincerely believe it is wrong to think of chance as a simple abstract concept can be a hypothesis and so forth. If you are meaning to say that chance means we don't know, for example, chaos theory, or it's in principle unknowable, for example, the most popular interpretation of quantum theory, or some combination thereof, and therefore it is more proper to speak of chance theories than chance theory, I might agree with you. If you mean that chance really does not exist or does not follow, even though it's statistical variations, statistical laws, then you've lost me. Uh, again, quoting... Uh, Frank Berry or any of you could have avoided all this by saying, by answering my question. I assume you meant to end your quote of yourself with a question mark. You've repeated this several times and I agree that some response, in my opinion, is warranted. I cannot speak for Berry, but will offer this suggestion subject to his correction. Yes, that is one chance hypothesis that can be safely eliminated and, eliminated, and so we have at least partial agreement. There are a number of other chance hypotheses, such as the coins were collected from a bank which aligned them into stacks, but without regard to their being heads or tails, from deposits which had been dumped into the bank, against, again without regard to their orientation, basically the equivalent of shuffling cards. Even if they were placed on the final table without turning them over, I would only accept the chance hypothesis after firmly ruling out virtually all remotely reasonable design hypotheses. For practical purposes, once I ruled out law, say by establishing that the coins were fair, I would consider design proved in this case. It is not as, and then quoting uh, 
It is not as if Barry answered no, what I mean is he just avoided answering the question. I agree. Perhaps he has his reasons, and if we are lucky, he may share them with us. In the meantime, I might point out that it is not just the particular hypothesis that you reject that should be rejected, but a whole class of hypotheses that can be safely rejected that can be reasonably described as chance hypotheses. Any hypothesis that should be expected to follow stochastic laws with anywhere close to an expected P value for heads of 50% for each individual coin, or for that matter, 90%, should be rejected absent the reasonably complete ruling out of design hypotheses. And then immediately after my comment, Barry Arrington uh, said, you quote Mark Franks, by chance do you mean a 50% and so forth. Um, then you say, I agree, perhaps he has his reasons, and if we are lucky, he may share them with us. And then you give the obvious reason I did not rise to Mark's bait. In the meantime, I might point out that uh, any a whole class and so forth, which we just read. As Sal has pointed out, one of the Darwinist's favorite tactic is to ask for endless definitions. In my experience, when a Darwinist asks for a definition, all he is doing is trying to change the subject. He does not really want to know the answer. You can be certain that this is what Mark was doing here. As you ably demonstrate, it did not matter what my definition of chance was, because no matter how one defines it, anything that can reasonably call, be called chance can be ruled out. This is glaringly obvious to even the most casual observer, which is why we can be sure Mark was not asking the question in good faith. Mark Frank, and he apologizes for the length of his comment, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, first thing is some criticism of Barry Arrington, which I will admit, if you want to read it, it's on the blog site. And then he says, as it happened, Paul responded. You may remember, in the meantime, I might point out that it's not this, just a particular hypothesis yada, yada, yada. This was just the kind of response I expected. It is constructive and throws light on what a chance hypothesis is. I agree with it and would modify my definition as a result with two provisos. One, the probabilities for each coin must be independent. Two, I don't understand the clause absent the reasonably complete ruling out of design hypothesis. There's another discussion there, but we're going to skip that part. Uh, but you can imagine how the conversation could continue. We would probably fail to agree and may, may even get a bit cross as almost everyone does on the internet debates, but we might also get a, both get a, a bit clearer about our own position and the opposing position. And then he launches into more criticism of Barry, which I, again I'm going to admit. Um, now, that is uh, much of the conversation over 500 coins found all heads. That's part of the background of today's uh, the, the, the uh, blog post I want to uh, use, uh, pay special attention to today. Um, the second part is found in to be or not to be. Um, and Barry Arrington uh, is commenting, comment number 274, so it's quite a ways down. E signer N, specification is what he's being quoted now. Uh, and the one just above. Is it functionality and is this detected how? Is it not projected or interpreted or assumed but really empirically de detected apart from complexity and by what measure? Well, the implied answer is no, but we'll see. ES, e signer, here are two 12 gr line groups of text. One, now if you look at this, you'll notice that there's some interesting little patterns here that, that uh, uh, so it's not completely random, but it's close. And the second group is to be or not to be, that is the question. For it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them, to die, to sleep no more. And by his sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die, to sleep, to sleep, perhaps to dream. Aye, there's the rub, for in that sleep of death what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil. Both groups are complex. One group was constructed through random strokes on a keyboard. The other was designed. Can you tell which is which? 
Certainly you can, and just as certainly it is not the degree of complexity that allows you to tell the difference. If anything, the random group is more complex than the design group. If the design group is less complex than the chance group, there must be something other than complexity that allows you to detect design. What do you think that something is? And uh, later on in another blog the next day, Update, at 2.99 in the post linked above, e Signer finally answers the question. We recognize English text because we learned the language. Of course, this is just another way of saying that we detect the design in the non-random text because it conforms to a specification, that is, the conventions of the English language. Note that this is exactly contrary to his first false assertion, which was, ID proponents say, it is complex, therefore it must be designed. Yes now admits he recognizes design in the complex second string of not merely because it was complex, but because it conformed to a specification. Now, yes, was that so hard? Welcome to the design, uh, wel welcome to the ID movement. And then, um, interestingly enough, this one got a straight call out from Jeffrey Shallot who argued that string one was less random than string two because it had less Kolmogorov information as measured by gzip. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But you think I'm kidding. This is a direct quote from the blog as a summary. String number two is more random than string number one. That is, to be or not to be is more random than hitting things on a... He actually made a case for it. If you accept that Kolmogorov information is the evidence for randomness, then to be or not to be actually has more Kolmogorov information. And he actually demonstrates that by using gzip. Well, kind of. The specification for one is the Hamlet soliloquy, and that's all you need. And then he had another comment that uh, I just put down there um, that I'm not going to review. And uh, there's a couple of replying comments. Has Jeffrey Shallot's fundamentalism driven him barking mad? Um, intelligent design, KF cuts to the chase again, and so forth. And we come to design detection. I tried to make a more clear argument using blocks of coins in two different areas, which I'll just give you those references. And then, um, and then the blog that uh, post that we started with. Uh, I think most of you can recognize that number three is designed. Notice that there is a flaw in the design, and yet that doesn't eliminate design. So, here's some comments that are of interest. WD-400, I'm not giving all of the comments. I'm primarily focusing on people who would like to deny the possibility of design. Um, actually, it's an example of well-defined and tractable chance hypothesi. I think it should be the hypotheses, but whatever. Uh, spreading coins randomly. If proponents of CSI-like measures could produce the same, they'd have something. Hmm. And then Rod W, I'm pretty sure the first two are random, but the third was designed. Am I correct? One could use this technique to show that proteins are designed if there was no, other w no way other than random assembly of generating proteins. But of course, there is. So my comment of, on that, well, first of all, I said, all oh, if you go to this particular website, which we'll go to next, does that change your answer? I think you will see that it will. And then Silver Asiatic said, so far we got, uh, or I said two Silver Asiatic. So far we got only one comment, now two. Uh, I started this before um, um, Rod W's had posted. From an intelligent design denier that I recognize, uh, that yellow is not a yellow smiley face. It just happens to be that, that the color of their smiley faces is yellow. Uh, that I recognize WD400 at number 8, and now Rod W at, one, at, at 13. That 
And that comment agreed with the obvious conclusion and sought to make a distinction between this kind of probability argument and the probability arguments regarding life. It looks like we have an acceptance of the principle of design detection and the dispute is about the details. There is some hope. What do you all think about the following arguments? All three have heads tails uh, ratios statistically close to 0 0.5 and so must be random. No? A non-random pattern can be misinterpreted as random. Therefore, a random pattern can be misinterpreted as non-random and the method fails. There was no prior hypothesis by you design detectors. Therefore, your detection is invalid. You didn't know what you were looking for when you ran into it. Any pattern is equally valid. See Nirad, who was saying that so sarcastically, copying other people who were saying so for real. So they are all likely to be random. We can't detect design unless we know how the design was made. True? No? We can't detect design unless we know who the designer was. No? Number three can't be designed because it has an imperfection. A couple of other commenters commented on that. Tongue in cheek. Number three can't be designed because if it is not designed, it is not designed. And if it is designed, it says that it is due to chance and therefore not designed. <laughs> It's a good thing that there are 560 bits to each in each design because only half that amount of bits could not reasonably indicate design. <laughs> and then I said to Rod, uh, to WD400 and Rod W, welcome to the dark side. And uh, that was uh, actually a, a winky face instead of a smiley face, but unfortunately I don't have the font to give you the winky face. So let's go to that website. The website is binary pi. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to select the first 560 digits. We're going to cut them and paste them. Now we're going to take out the 256 and the 512, and we're going to rearrange them in rows of 35. OK? Now we're going to put zeros between all the ones that don't have zeros between, uh, pardon me, spaces between all the ones that don't have spaces in between them. So we get a nice grid. Now we're going to slide picture number two behind that grid. Notice something? Every single one of those, except for one, is a zero that's showing. That one is an oopsie. Now, wasn't planned, by the way. Now, supposing we take that white grid and we turn it into a black grid. The black numbers now disappear, but you'll notice that all of these have ones in them. In other words, it, except for that one digit, precisely matches binary pi. Now, how many of you think that I just threw out the coins and got that? No takers? So number 16, Mark Frank, comes along, comments, I, I don't see the point of your original post. No one is denying the ability to detect if something is designed. Really? The dispute is how and when you can detect design. And in particular, do you have to know something about the context in which it was created to detect if it was designed? Or can you tell simply from some intrinsic property of the object itself, as Dembski would argue? A, a relevant question would be, could someone or something that knew nothing about human language and writing detect the three was designed? And Mung comments, Mark, we get people in here all the time who, that assert the design is not detectable. E signer comes to mind as a recent example. Notice all of a sudden, who designed number three doesn't seem to be an issue. Hidden and mysterious powers of the putative designer don't seem to be irrelevant all of a sudden. The motive, also not relevant. Their religion, not relevant. Do they have a wedge document? Not relevant. Uh, are they a secret admirer of the Discovery Institute? Not relevant. <laughs> <laughs> And then he quotes Mark Frank, the dispute is how and when you detect design and so forth. And he says, I think that misrepresents Dembski. Has he dropped specification? 
Also, I'd wager that the Smithsonian has more than a few devices that we are pretty certain were designed, but have no knowledge of the context in which they were created. So that objection fails, and you present us with a false dichotomy, and so on. And then RVB8 comes in in 24 and says, all three are clearly designed as they use perfect little five millimeter circles of clear black and white shadings. The possibility that nature could produce these perfect little black and white sh circles is, wait a minute, maybe not. The third has words. What is the point of this post? It should have been produced by news. My comment, Mark Frank, you stated that no one is deny, de denying the ability to detect if something is designed. Welcome also to the dark side. And again, that's a winky face. If we are not brights, we must be the dark side. That's another winky face. I, I think that Mung is more accurate as to how ID de de deniers, at least those who speak up on this site, usually act. You raise an interesting question. Could someone or something that knew nothing about human language and writing detect that three was designed? I don't know what kind of being you would be writing about. Certainly humans would have a very unusual upbringing not to, to know nothing about human language and writing. If there are any intelligent enough, non-humans around, they are all too familiar with human language and writing. I rather suspect that a Korean or Chinese person with no knowledge of English writing or even an illiterate person could pick out number three as designed even if she or he could not read it. But this is missing the point. Your comments might point to someone with a de defect in design detection, just like a person who is colorblind might not be able to tell the difference between design and non-design. It doesn't go to the heart of the real question, how do we know that number three is designed? Because, of course, it is a correct inference. Finding ways we could be wrong is not as important as knowing why we are right if we want to learn something and not simply carp, and so on. And then I comment to RVB8, welcome also to the dark side. You see no point in the post. Consider the fact that when Barry Arrington made a very similar post, which refers back to uh, the uh, uh, to be or not to be uh, flap, his detractors seem to argue that semi-random banging on a keyboard was less random than the Hamlet soliloquy. It seems that there was a need to go over the material once again just to nail down the point that sometimes we can detect design, and it is obvious. If you can see that, you can stay for the discussion of how we detect design when we do. Then later, once we know partly how to detect design, we can discuss if life exhibits evidence of design. And going on. Um, Mark Frank comes back. Uh, I don't know what kind of being you'd uh, be writing about. He's, of course, quoting me, uh, but this is missing the point. And he says, agreed. It is a hypothetical example. Whether such people actually exist is not relevant. A little problem with punctuation, but what, you know. And uh, then uh, I comment on a comment of uh, PAV. Again, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but the most important stuff. I disagree on the ability to be sure that image two is designed. This is not just because I happen to know how it was designed, as I was the designer. It is also because I know how hard it is to get the first six, 560 binary digits of pi, which is itself the pattern that emerges. If one is randomly guessing, the probability is 1 in 2 to the 560th power, which is roughly 1 in 3 times 8 times 3.8 times 1 in times 10 to the 168th power. That number is well above the Dembski universal probability bound, let alone the, in my opinion, more reasonable Dawkins reasonable bound of 10 to the 50th. One could reduce the probability by saying that black could stand for 1 and white could stand for 0, with inverted. But that only multiplies the probability times 2. One could further increase the probability by saying we start at the right instead of the left, factor of 2, or perhaps go back and forth factor of 2, or start at the bottom, factor of 2, or go up and down, factor of 2 for all variations. We could even spiral in or out, much less than a factor of 2 at this point. After trying all these variations, we will have reduced the odds to somewhat worse than 1 in 
2 to the 554th power, or 5 times 10 to the 166th, which is trivial odds. One can claim that there are other special numbers, such as 2 times pi, pi over 2, and pi over 4, but they all have the same binary digits. One simply moves the decimal, or more precisely, binary place over. Perhaps one can simply divide by 3, multiply by 3, divide by 5, or multiply by 5 and still get a special number, but this only raises our odds by 5. Besides the fact that we hit dead on, a very special number makes these hypotheses seem ad hoc. One could argue for E, or perhaps the square root of 2, which equals the square root of 1 half in binary except for the binary place. But this only raises the probability by a factor of 3. This is still way beyond the Dembski universal probability bound. Even if there is somehow an error in the transcription, which there was, uh, but I didn't know it when I was writing this, point mutation or single frame shift deletion or addition of 1 or 0. This gives us about 2,237, uh, or roughly 2 to the 11th rise in probability. This is peanuts in comparison with 2 to the 560 or even 2 to the 554th. That is why after I had created image 1, I didn't even bother to check to see if the binary digits of pi or any of those other numbers could be found in it. I am mildly surprised to note that Silver Asiatic found a variant, not perfect, there are two white separators at one point, of 3.141 at the beginning. I would have been totally astounded if the pattern had continued to the next two digits, 5 and 9. And if you're wondering what I'm talking about, there it is. You can see three black dots, one black dot, four black dots, one black dot at the very beginning. Totally random. N while I agree with C.K. Lester that one cannot be 100% sure that two is designed, after the pattern is pointed out and verified, one can be 99.9999, 160 more nines percent sure that it is designed. And that would be good enough for me. Also, without knowing the backstory, one could not be sure that one, number one was not designed, or at least the head's tail string was not designed. It seems reasonable in the absence of convincing evidence otherwise to accept it as random. And then I went, uh, uh, a general comment, my own thoughts at present on the subject of design detection are as follows. We recognize design when we find a pattern that makes sense from a design perspective that is not required by law, not likely by chance, and not made likely by some combination of chance and law. Law is a possible explanation in the case of 500 coins with all heads up, although almost all chance explanations can be ruled out. The law explanation of two-headed coins cannot be ruled out, and in fact explains the phenomenon perfectly. That is why my illustrations avoided that example. Pure chance cannot explain images 2 and 3, but can explain image 1, and therefore we can assume image 1 is random, but can uh, assume with well over 1 minus 2 to the 500th power probability to the minus 500th power probability that both images 2 and image 3 are not due to chance, virtual certainty. I have not seen any law-like processes that cause the binary digits of pi to be laid out, and neither have I seen any law-like processes that cause English words to be laid out in binary code that have not been designed. This requirement excludes computer programs. In the absence of such law-like processes or law and chance-like processes, that could explain the appearance of design, the appearance is best taken at face value. This evaluation would have to change if such processes were discovered, but science has to deal with the known, and it is reasonable to draw the apparently obvious conclusion until such time as its obviousness comes under challenge. One can claim that in the case of image 3, the target area is large. This is true. It is certainly larger than the area of the pi target, see my comments in number 61, which you just read. The pattern of heads and tails could have been reversed, increasing the target area by a factor of 2. The top half or the bottom half could have been reversed, another factor of 2. A different font could have been selected, perhaps a factor of 1,024 or 2 to the 10th. Different short English words could have been chosen, perhaps a factor of a uh, little over a million or 2 to the 20th, 
or a different written language could have been chosen, perhaps a factor of 16,000 or 2 to the 14th. Although, to be fair, English is the second most common language and the most common on the Internet. And there is only one mistake, pardon me, and there is one mistake which could have happened in any of the 560 or roughly 2 to the 9th spots. This makes our target sequence somewhere in the neighborhood of 2 to the 55th sequences, thus increasing the probability of hitting the target randomly to roughly 1 in 2 to the 505 power or less. The positive evidence for design, plus the extremely low probability of finding the target by either chance or any known chance law combination, rationally supports our instinctive selection re reaction that image 3 must have been designed. But perhaps someone else has a better explanation of how we accurately detect design. And then I go on to make one more comment. P.S. image 3 is specified by language and meaning, although ironic, whereas image 2 is specified by function. So don't be surprised if you don't immediately see the meaning in a long string of DNA bases. I should have said that codes for something. In other words, you can't just look at it and tell that it was designed any more than you can look at that pi thing and tell it was designed. Um, I'm going to finish with what turns out to be the final comment, which has been December 26, and nobody's commented since. And it said, e-signer. I'll try one more time. And the reason I'm using just this one comment is because otherwise I'd be wind up reading things over and over again. You said, and you totally ignored in that same post, I said with equal ease they can all be said to be designed. That is, you totally ignored my point. And I think he's wrong, and I'll show you why. You read that post and responded to it, but you've forgotten the entire exchange. My 115 was responding to your 82, which was responding to my 79, which was responding to your 65. You may recall that you said in 65, all answers seem applicable to the original post. Yes, all three are designed because they are all made of design coins or they have a structured distinction of black and white sides. No, none of the three is designed because they are computer-generated images consisting of bits and bytes in virtual web space and any perception of structure, color, words, etc. is objectively not there in the fundamental constituents of the images but read into them by the observer. Whatever that means. <clears throat> if I read this correctly, it was a claim that the question of design did not have an unequivocal answer because about any image one could rationally claim that it was either designed or undesigned, depending on, on one's pre presuppositions. My answer was to agree with you that they might be all designed, and in a certain sense all were designed. You are correct. There can be layers of design. In fact, it is even possible, some of us actually think it is correct, that the entire universe is designed and then in the, quote, random, end quote, parts, it is designed to look random, but it's not actually so. After all, even in random collections of atoms, the atoms themselves are anything but random. They're digitized and all have discrete sizes. The detection of design in some objects does not preclude undetectable design in other objects. I just illustrated that point to the satisfaction of most readers with image two. However, I vigorously dissented with your claim that none of them is designed. You're trying to tell me and onlookers that I didn't design image 3 and that computers and therefore computer generated images aren't designed, that virtual web space isn't highly designed, that any perception of color, structure, words, etc. is objectively not there in the fundamental constituents of the images but read into them by the observer? Wow. I've got one thing to say. You haven't gone over to the dark side. Um, <coughs> That's, again, a, a winky face. You then detect, uh, defended in 82 your idea that from one perspective, none of them were designed. Obviously, I'm saying that it depends on the perspective. The bits and bytes are invisible, and they are not letters. If you tell me letters, words, uh, etc., are designed, then you're taking a whole different level for your analysis. The level of English grammar and orthography, and you will have to specifically justify your selection on the l of the level of analysis. As long as you have not done it, and you have not, the noise of basic bits and bytes is just as good as any other level. Okay. I then thought you were going full postmodern on me and left you to your own narrative in 115. 
Well, I suppose you're right. If we start with the presupposition that there's no design anywhere, then the answer we will always get, get to the question of design is no. Somehow I don't find that a very attractive starting presupposition. And I would go so far as to say that its adoption would destroy science. But if that's what it takes for you to deny design, and you're willing to take it, far be, from me, far be it from me to interfere with your world. However, it would then appear that any further discussion with you would be fruitless, and without a change, I don't expect to further communicate with you. Uh, of course, I didn't repeat post 79 in detail, as I'd already replied to you, and we agreed that in certain aspects of the images, they could both be said, or could all three be said to have been designed. But that background was already there. So while in 115 you can claim that I did not mention the point that all three images could be said to be designed, I did not ignore your point, as I'd already agreed with that part of it. It missed a D on that. That's an error. Um, and that there was no need to repeat it to someone with an adequate memory and goodwill. However, as your memory seems to be fading, I have repeated it here. And then, quoting him again, the point is that since all options can with equal success be determined as either designed or not, there's no design detection going on at all. It's mere design assumption that has its force elsewhere, not in empiricism. If you are saying that you cannot tell that image three is designed in a way that is realistically incompatible with shaking coins together multiple times, spreading them out, and recording the heads and tails as white or black, or black and white, whereas image one is compatible with that story, then I'm afraid I cannot help you. And that's the last thing that was said. Now my own take is very simple. Design detection, I think, is possible. We've demonstrated some of it. The concept of specified complexity is the best justification currently known. The design filter of Dembski, in fact, um, when you add to it law and chance processes, as well as just law or chance, um, should work. Irreducible complexity just adds in for practical purposes Darwinian evolution can't work here and is a valid uh, argument. I think with proper examples, the point is, in fact, inarguable unless you want to completely turn uh, uh, reality loose. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes? I have an interesting question that just occurred to me as I was thinking about all of this. Does Darwinian evolutionary model actually require information in living organisms? Well, you know, the original Darwinian model left the origin of life as possibly a created thing. Well, so maybe... The information was originally created and then gradually devolved to where we are. But, but it seems to me that the original Darwinian model was, was, was put together before uh, biology became aware of DNA information. Well, it's absolutely true. Yeah, Darwin, the original Darwinian model really didn't take information into account because it had no conception of how much there, information there was. It, it never was. It, it was always uh, just a talk that things somehow become more functionally competent over time uh, by, by, by selecting all things that are less competent out. Well, there was the picture that the animal had somehow stabilized itself except for one or two features that were starting, that were varying, um, perhaps lots of features that were varying, but that were all varying, you know, either larger or smaller or, you know, faster or slower or uh, kind of turning things into binary, which meant that y you wanted to become faster. So there was a clear goal in mind. And the mechanics of how you get to that goal were totally ignored because they didn't know about them. To be frank, we still don't know everything about them.
but we know that some of the things require new enzymes. And that's a concept that would not have been available to Darwin. But it, it's, it, it's magical thinking in a way. It almost seems to me that, that um, it somehow alludes to a selection that would work if somebody is actually trying to make something work and they're selecting alternatives that are not working. So in, in a very real sense, when we're learning from scratch, that's perhaps what we're doing. Do you see what the Darwinist model seems to suggest a kind of learning that's happening? Yes. In, and the, in the production of things. Uh huh. Um, Trial and error. But you see, the problem is that you still have to have somebody who is trying to make the stuff because the stuff doesn't make itself. Well, see, that's the problem. Does it take one point mutation to get where you need to go, or does it take an entire series of point mutations? In fact, next week we'll delve into that specific question. Yeah, I, may, I may sound somewhat heretical, but I'm trying here to almost be the devil's advocate here and to look at things from Darwinist point of view to see how it potentially could work if it could work, you know? Right. Uh, and I'm having trouble finding a good way of doing it without somebody learning something while they're trying to make it happen. Well, and that's the problem, of course, is the blind watchmaker is blind. It's not only blind, it's unconscious. How do you get from here to there with an unconscious? <laughs> not only blind, but unconscious. Uh, it's, <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't do that. I have an observation about pattern number three, which I think everyone in this room would acknowledge as designed. We know the designer. It was you. Yeah, that's right. However, you asserted, acknowledged, that there was a flaw in it. Yeah. Yes. I contend that that isn't a flaw. It's known as a bullet. It's a very common graphic device. <laughs> It was exquisitely pla placed. It was obviously by design, even if you didn't design it. Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, uh, that, that was designed into it specifically as a flaw. Yeah, you, however, it turned out to be a perfect bullet. It, 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 <laughs> it turns out very close to a perfect bullet. The, the one thing that, uh, that, I, that I will say is that uh, uh, you will see certain models that will have one uh, mole on them and are otherwise perfect. And they call those things beauty marks. Uh, whether they should or not is a different question, but I, I think that it, the, the point is that, that one thing like that does not destroy and, and, and this, is the, this is the point. You don't have to have imperfect design. I mean, you don't have to have perfect design before you can call it design. And that is, was specifically put in there for that reason. Now, the pie thing, that was an accident. But it doesn't matter whether it's accidental or whether it's deliberate. The odds. They're still both designed. There's still a lot of it. A lot of hay has been made by people who first argued that various parts of our organs are uh, obviously without obvious function, therefore must be leftovers of some evolutionary process and thus cannot be designed. And then the same argument was raised regarding the supposed junk DNA, which later on was discovered not to be so junky. 
the, the point is, is if you have specification and it's highly unlikely to happen by either chance or law or some combination of chance or law, then it's design. Period. And all of those other arguments are smoke screens. So, so that's the issue is not having a specification because there could maybe be some specification that those other designs met that we're just not aware of. Well, uh, you mean like the number one? Yeah, number one and, and two, you know, maybe there's some other code. Well, number or two something. meets the code, and I showed you the code. In other words, you're raising the very important point, and that is we cannot always detect design. But if the design is detected, it cannot be explained as chance. You see, well, it, 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 in other words, even what appears as chance might be designed, but the reverse is not true. Yeah, and, and this is an important point. And see, this is the part that gets scary for these people is because they know where the next step goes. What about life? <clears throat> That's the, that's the next step. And, people, and, and, and they don't have an answer for it. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to cut it off at the pass and say there's no such thing as design. You saw people arguing in the face, you know, you're gonna tell me that number three was done by throwing coins? Give me a break. As a matter of fact, now that you've seen the pattern, you're gonna tell me that number two was done by throwing coins. Number one, maybe. Well, the other thing is, as soon as we do detect design, we always, the next question is who, who designed it? So that's, that's the natural everything we do. And so to then say, you know, we see organization and then say, well, it just happened by chance, that's, well, that's the specious that, argument. You've got exactly, well, you see, you see where this is going really fast. Life. Looks designed. Everybody knows that. Even Richard Dawkins knows that. So he calls it apparent design. He calls it apparent design, but you know what that means is it has the appearance of design. Now, if life cannot be reached by an evolutionary perspective, and you know you, you can make a kind of a halfway case about. Uh, uh, evolution from one kind of life to another because you can keep them alive in the meantime. Uh, it's not very good, but you can, you can kind of sort of maybe get there. Um, you can't do that for life itself. The original first life, there are no stepping stones. There are no way places that you can wait until you can gather your strength for the next step. You either make it up there in one step or you don't. And see, they know this, and they know they don't have any theories as to the origin of life. And they know that it looks designed, and if you take that at face value, that means that life is designed. The next question is, by whom? Well, whoever it is, it's a whole lot smarter than we are because we can't copy the pattern yet, let alone design our own. And that raises some very interesting, what kind of creatures are so, that much smarter than we are? <laughs> I mean, you can see where this goes really, really fast. It, it, it underlines, uh, just, just to emphasize this point that you raised a little more, everything that can happen by chance can also be designed. But not everything that can be designed may happen by chance. You see, the other way around does not work. And I mean, you have seen perhaps in some museums of modern art, they, they looked on 60 Minutes, they showed, and one piece was just a pile of dirt. I think, yeah, well, I see that a lot. I never thought it was an art piece. <laughs> but in that particular case, it was designed. It's not necessarily uh, excluding the possibility of chance producing the same mm, form. But the other way around, 
Do you understand what I'm trying to the say? The Mona Lisa is not going to be found on some uh, mountainside. Just, just by throwing paint together. Oh, we have a comment in the back. Um, so I'm wondering if there could be uh, maybe a fourth uh, picture, and that is something that has the appearance of design, but uh, had uh, random input into it. Um, and I, you know, I don't know exactly what that would be. Uh, are there some, some fractals that have random input, but according to some pattern that it, that it makes it look like leaves of, you know, frond leaves of, um, of ferns, if you know what I mean? Well, if you had a fractal pattern, you would have to have a computer that would compute for each one and put it down. And while the pattern may be not completely designed at the beginning, the pattern, uh, the pattern maker required a design. So that, that would have two parts. It's like you have the formula, which would have been creative, by right. an intelligent designer, but the input is randomness. But the input is not random because, <coughs> because the input is coming out from a computer. And the computer itself is not random. And see, that's the, that's the problem. If you, take, if you take humans and their products completely out, then nature as we know it is not capable of producing certain things one of them being life. And see, that's why the argument is so important for them to stop at the beginning before we ever get discussing how you detect design, because once we get to the discussion, they're obviously going to lose. So they've got to, they've got to quash it before it ever gets started. And that's why you have E. Siner making inane statements. I mean, you know, the internet uh, computers are not designed. They just kind of fall out of mountainsides or something. You know, this is crazy. But that's what he's insisting, because he can't have design in his world. Because if he admits that there's design, then he looks at life and it's overwhelmingly designed and there's no mechanism to get there from chance or law or any combination of chance or law that we know of. And if you're going to follow the obvious, you know, that's where you're going. And the truth of the matter is that we need to recognize this. I, intelligent design movement doesn't want to say that because they're afraid of it. Because what they think is that once you do that, then you've automatically gotten into religion. Well, the problem is the reason these people take their stance is because they don't want to get into religion. And that, by the way, brings up one other point that my daughter pointed out to me. And that is, why are we, as believers in God, that worried about what non-believers are going to think about our philosophy? that at a certain point we should be saying, look, you guys are biased against our conclusion. You know, you need to, if you're going to appeal to us, and you need to appeal on a basis that we can accept. That's what they're doing to us. In a sense, we should be doing it right back to them, at least in as so far as we're going to surrender our belief system to them. Bob. Uh, well, two things. First of all, all that random junk DNA which they, was, you alluded to, which they have gleefully looked at for years is actually what makes one species differ from another. If you look at the protein coding sequences, they're much the same, and the evolutionists would say they're conserved. Um, what they're, makes they're actually right about the enzymes in men and monkeys. Yes. But, but what they called junk before, because we, we were not able to detect the design there, 
is now what the ENCODE project says. That's what makes us different from mice. Because if you look at our protein coding sequences and mice, mice protein coding sequences, they're often indistinguishable. And what's so, more, I think you can take the genes and interchange them and you still are, yes. you, get, you still get That's mice. why we use mice, the pharmaceutical companies use, uh, you know, that's their prefer, preferred species. And then they go up to primates uh, before they finally introduce them into human beings. But the second thing I'd like to point out is that one, the non-designed people will look at DNA and, 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 and what you really have is a lot of code and some of the code is working against other code. And that would then, as Dawkins said, if, if there is a creator, it just seems to me awfully foolish for him to have set up, he or, her, he or she, to have set up the system to look like it could have, you know, it was more, it was random. It has parts that work against each other and, and that are warring with each other. And there's a war going on in your DNA constantly for supremacy. Mm -hmm. And my answer to that is because no one has considered that there's possibly two designers, an original and then someone else who comes in and tries to overwrite or rewrite. And now you get a situation that is somewhat obfuscated because you have a, you're now looking instead of one designer, you need to look at two. You're, you're looking at, uh, to put it another way, as if an automobile had a bunch of catches to keep it from moving. It was designed originally yes. to move, and then, and then there are things that are designed to keep it from moving. Or that make it, if it goes, uh, you know, it can't turn right. It can only turn left. So if there was a designer, why would that be in there? unless you had two designers, one original designer and then someone else who came in and monkeyed with the car later, so it can't turn, can't turn left. Yeah. And the, the point of it is that the two designers do not negate design. They're just designing against each other. They're just designing against each other. And this is the, this is the key. Um, incompetent design does not mean no design. Malevolent design does not mean no design. Uh, malevolent design means there's a malevolent designer. It's that simple. And if, if it requires a design to get to malaria parasites, then I say there's, an, there's a malevolent designer. And by the way, that means that if your religion is going to reflect reality, it needs a malevolent designer. Yes, it does. And a good example for you, actually the best one is leprosy. Uh, Mycobacterium leprae has uh, originally had over between three and 5,000 genes. It's been reduced to less than 1,000. And that's why it can only live in human flesh. And it's uh, a parasite that completely takes over the cell, changes it back to a stem cell, so we can go along the Schwann cells back up and spread throughout the nervous system. No. Expertly engineered. If you want to look at that by chance to come in and knock out all of the prior protein con coding um, areas and make a new perfectly designed parasite that comes in and knows exactly, uh, you know, stem cells are extremely complex. We're, st we're pluripotent all the way. You know, we're, we're still trying to work in this area. We don't understand it. Someone else, or this organism by chance, was able to figure out what we can't do. It takes a fully differentiated cell, changes it back to a stem cell. And they're trying to figure out how it does it. That, look at that engineering. With now, all of our minds working on it, we can't do it consistently. And here is uh, a microbacterium that is able to do that and then get spread throughout the body in that way. And, um, to, to look at that and say someone didn't come in who had a whole lot of knowledge and figure out how to alter this bacteria to be able to do that, to me, just it goes beyond reason. Now, to be fair, for the, uh, if you're degenerating things, knocking things out is a whole lot easier than putting in new ones. And That's true, but you have to know what to knock, just the argument that you know what to knock out. Uh, Self-important. Yeah. Someone would have to do some calculations as to what the probabilities of knocking this, knocking that, knocking the other thing out, and see what you get out of all of that before I think I would be able to make a coherent. That you'd have to establish that it couldn't happen by chance. And, and, and or knocking if it did, out it would be absolutely prohibitively small. 
Well, what you want to do is you want to you would want to make that argument with specific numbers. Yeah. Uh, but the point is anyway that all of those dodges don't eliminate the fact that it's design. Uh, that at the bare minimum, the proto lepro uh, bacterium was designed. At the bare minimum, the proto human, the proto life is designed. You can say other things are degenerating, but design detection is in fact a positive that is supported by, uh, uh, that it looks designed is actually a decent argument. And, the, and you confirm that up by saying it, it hits a very small target area in a very wide search and that there's no mechanism to point to that target area other than that it works, which is a teleological explanation, not a mechanistic one. Um, I, I think we've beaten this thing to death pretty well. What, what uh, bothers me is the question, having recognized that life is not a product of chance, how then should we live? See, this to me is a far more important point rather than for us as Adventists to be perpetually on the defensive wondering what the incursion of uh, paganism will be. No, the question is, how do we develop a sane, rational mm, consciousness of how we see God, how we see one another, how we see those who do not s see things the way we do, in such a way that we would be a blessing to everyone, to one another and to everyone else, and that we would be an honor to God's name. And not, <laughs> how should I say, the fulfillment of one of those predictions of Jesus when he told the disciples, and you will be persecuted and killed by people who will believe that they're doing it for God's, for the will of God. You know what I'm saying? How do we avoid that pitfall? How do we keep the truth? How do we honor the good and not fall into the trap of trying to enforce it on those who are not as fortunate to be able to see it? and help them to see it in some way, but help them to see it in a beautiful way that they would be more empowered and blessed by it. Paul, not you, Paul, but the Paul who wrote uh, 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he says that the evil prince of this world has darkened the minds of those who are not and these are my, this is a paraphrase, of those who have not been enlightened by God and they cannot see this. It is dark, darkened their, and the Greek word is their ability to perceive. So we're, there's a lot more going on with this, and, it, uh, and that's the million, the, so the million dollar questions. Yes, you've got to shine light. You've got to make them decide they, they are, that maybe they need to see something else. There may be something else out there. And that really is the Holy Spirit. And we're, you know, we, we show up as to be a, uh, what did Christ say to the two demoniacs uh, at Gennaraset? He said, you go back and tell everybody what I did for you. That's how you break through. The first time they wanted Christ gone and he cast out the devils into the swine. And when he came back about six months later, the whole entire region was there waiting for his boat. So that's the only biblical reason that I, a big biblical example that I think really shines a light on this clearly. And he says, you go tell them what I did for you. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, along that same line, uh, uh, it seems to me that the reasonable, rational world pretty soon is 
going to probably switch more from uh, even the scientific world, probably going to switch more from uh, atheism to deism. And in, in doing this, they will acknowledge there is some kind of designer. And, and a lot of people say, yeah, there's something back there. But it's not going to be at all the Bible, a recent creation, flood, uh, this type of thing. And uh, the issue may become more salient, uh, I think, as... I mean, this this question of life is becoming so incredibly complex. Uh, I don't see how reasonable people are going to stay where they are. But they're not going to say, hey, uh, six, 10,000 years ago, there was a six-day creation. I think this is where Adventism has a major contribution to make. Well, I think so, too. And I think that uh, eventually... I think what it, this kind of thing does is not so much it preaches the entire gospel as it gives an opening so that people who previously couldn't hear it because they had been told by their society, oh, this design stuff is a bunch of hooey. Yeah. I, I think what it does is it allows them to ask the questions all over again. Yes. And it's basically the same thing that happened at the fall of communism in various countries. That, right. that People who had never asked the question before seriously because, well, everybody knows that, uh, you know, we've been here for millions of years and it's all by chance and God had nothing to do with it, well, it if God exists at all. Um, that that whole answer, that whole kind of answer falls apart. And then you can ask the question, well, what is God like? And I think that's basically what this kind of thing does. And that's why I made a point of it today, and that's why I was blogging before that, you know, uh, or commenting on blogs, which I think, well, in one case, blogging. Uh, I think it does present to people in a more clear way the fact that, in fact, you can't get away from design. And sometimes the de design detection is obvious. Not always, but sometimes. Well, a couple of questions. First one, well, he's gone, but maybe you could make a comment on where does the idea, the creator say, thus far you'll come and no more? With, say, Lucifer, uh, messing with the genetic code, is there one point where the Lord says, you cannot, I'll not allow you to go mess with genetic code or whatever, you know, w with the creation? How far does he allow? a created being Lucifer or to go with messing around with the creation. Uh, Talk the, about the The answer thing. I'd have to give to that question is I don't know. Because this looks like, you know, when you can mess with the genetic code, you're really getting into the very core of creation itself. Uh, in some ways you are. Yeah, that's... <laughs> no, the other question? The other question is really... Uh, it's. It's very sad, and all of us Adventists here, uh, that when the world is hurting for answers, we, Seventh-day Adventists, have dedicated one general conference session to the ordination question. I mean, I mean that really, truly really bothers me, you know. Uh, we have a message. It's the controversy is not about ordination. It's about between between the creator and the Lucifer, you see? So why are we being distracted to? Uh, why was it started from the very beginning, male dominance? I mean, to me, I'm the pastor, son, uh, son of a pastor. Um, it's not that someone wants to be a pastor. It's because uh, he's chosen to be. Uh, someone wanting to be should not be there. To, that's how I, that's my. Uh, this might, I know it's off the course of what we're yeah. talking about, but it just, just absolutely bothers me. I believe that the job is really not, not going to be finished by the organized church. It's impossible. Right. Well, I, that's right. In it's fact, impossible. In, in fact, the whole thing of using the organized church, I think, is gonna, it's going to fall apart. Uh, the, we the did have one comment back here. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, he's back. Uh, um, uh, what does... Uh, Okay, go ahead. Could I? Sure. Where does the creator <laughs> say, well, Lucifer, our created being, <clears throat> you are allowed to come so far? 
but I'm not going to allow you to mess with this. Is that genetic code can be messed around with uh, the, the created beings, or is there one spot where the Lord says you cannot go beyond this? And then Paul. we had one comment way in the back as well. Yeah. Well, first of all, obviously we have to make a number of assumptions, and you know some people may disagree with the assumptions, but I will give you what I believe. Um, and I've looked at this, I'd say, pretty extensively over 10 years. Um, when in Genesis 3, was it 15 or 18, I'm blinking, where Christ, uh, well, Christ came to Adam and Eve and the serpent, he says, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and, and its seed. And if you go look up the Hebrew word, um, it's Sarah, and it, it, there's seven different Hebrew words that you can use to delineate uh, the ability to have uh, offspring in, in different ways. This is the one that comes closest to be what we would call um, uh, information system transfer. We'd call it DNA, but for the Hebrew words. And um, when a cell is eight cells in the blastocele as it's going into being a blastocele, at eight cells after an egg is fertilized by a sperm, the entire process stops. All of the uh, chromosomes line up in those eight cells. All the pairs line up together, and then something very interesting happens. All the chromosomes unwind, and three specific enzymes come in, and they demethylate every single area that's methylated. And another enzyme comes along, and I forgot its name at this moment, and it starts meth methylating. And what it does is it methylates the areas of the DNA that in mice, for instance, if you stop this process, the fetus, I mean, it never goes to an em embryo or a fetus. It, it dies at that point. It's, me, my words now, it sets the table. It takes off all of the parental methylation to some degree. And there's such thing as parental imprinting, and that has to do with uh, microRNAs and uh, circular RNAs uh, that are added in on exosomes that come in on the, with the sperm and are in the egg. So I'm differentiating that. What it does is it wipes the slate clean. And that's why when you go ahead, remember, was it Molly, the g sheep that was uh, cloned? Yeah, Dolly. Dolly. There you go. Um, the reason why she lived very because the methylation, they, we don't know how to go in and demethylate everything before we recombine or, or we take a cell and take it back to a stem cell. We don't know how to take the methylation off. And so with aging, she methylates certain important, important protein coding or directive areas. And so she, and that's why we die. We lose capability to, um, for our cells to continue to replicate themselves and to keep certain and that's why we get disease, certain processes. That's all that happens, and that's why you die. We can't do that. But the cell at that, uh, um, I'm going to use a creator because I'm clearly on that, from that perspective, created a system that goes in on all these brand new human lives that come in and takes care of all of the methylation. And I'm using that as one term. There's three or four things the cell uses to bind up B DNA, change things around. I'm using methylation as an example of all of them since it's over, over 80%. We can't do that. And uh, the creator did that. And that limits what the devil can do. So, so I, I mean, this is quite interesting. I wasn't aware of that. Um, so is methylation, um, can there not, can, is there no epigenetics with methylation because all the methylations from the adult, from the parents is wiped clean? There's all kinds of methylation, uh, epigenetic methylation control. But what we're doing is we're starting at the very inception. And in order to, there's a certain amount of that DNA, uh, roughly about 30 to 40 percent of what we used to call junk DNA, that has to be methylated or the, uh, the, it's no longer a viable um, embryo or zygote, whatever however you want to call it. The organism dies. The, the organism dies. You have to have that. But what it does is it removes all of the, uh, you know, the parental methylation that came in that they acquired over their lifetime. It eliminates, we can't be certain, but a great majority of it. So let's just say a significant amount. Because uh, the people looking at this aren't, it, we don't have enough scientific ability to go in and really start going, looking at it carefully. But this happens 
no one knows how those enzymes know exactly which methylation to take off and which to leave. And then to remethylate. So everything is diluted, denuded, all methylation comes off. And once you do that, that cell's not going anywhere. You better come in and methylate. And that's how embryos become, uh, zygotes become embryos, become, it's by selectively, the cell is able to methylate certain areas and open up other areas at the right time. It's like choreating, uh, uh, choreographing a dance as to which parts of the DNA uh, are, are, are red at which times, in which sequences. And if you break that up, it's like baking a souffle. You don't get a final organism that's viable. So um, this is, if you read about it, look it up. It's remarkable. The complexity and, and you know, the, even the atheistic authors who write about it go, wow. This, you know, how would you argue that without design? I don't know. I, I, of course, they're arguing other things up here that I think are clearly designed too, so I'm sure they'll find a way to, to try to well, evade, see, evade this one. If you, if you decide that your worldview cannot have design, then you will find some way to eliminate it. A priori, you just say there isn't, then you have to find, no matter how, slight the, uh, how poor the explanation, if it's an explanation, you're still going to go with it. Yeah. Well, faith, you were that it wasn't designed. So, yeah. I think yeah. yeah. faith, then, that your theory is correct, and it's people who answer everything. Well, and, and this is, yeah, this, this is the important thing, is that if you want to, you can't ignore that. The scientific method is supposed to not use that kind of argument. So when people do that, they have immediately removed themselves from science. Yeah. They, they cannot claim that their science defense law. Yeah. But, but there is a, a whole segment of uh, uh, cosmology that, I'm not speaking of multiverse, that denies this. I mean, it, it goes into this area of uh, improbability and just uh, you say, well, it's still probable, and you just go ahead and... Uh, I know. In some yeah. universe, three came from flipping coins, and number one came from my design. Exactly. This could happen right. if you have enough universes. Uh, so then, so could this universe, uh, could a designer happen if you can have all possibilities? But, but this totally denies any laws of probability or anything. I mean, this is... This is a, well, I mean, it, if, if you think about it, it's insane. It's exactly. It is insane. I, I just wanted to comment, come back to what Danilo was saying and comments about uh, yeah. uh, women's ordination and so on. I, I really hope that uh, we can get over this game, uh, get back. I mean, so many of our youth are leaving the church. Uh, we bring in a lot of members and they, by the millions, and they're leaving by the millions. Uh, we need to get back to the work of this church. Uh, and because well, it's, it's a non-issue. Uh, uh, we're, we're, how, how do we get so involved in this non-issue? I, I, I don't know why. Uh, it's, not, it's not that important. Um, well, you know, it's kind of interesting because one could say that what we're doing right now is not that important either. But for a certain segment of the population, uh, it is. Because those are the people who have been told that if you believe in science, you've got to believe in evolution. You've got to believe that the first 12 chapters of Genesis or the first 11 chapters might as well not have been written. I, and the sad thing is that many theologians have been pushing that line of thinking. They have. They have. Um, well, we will have to see what happens anyway. Come back next week and we'll go through the uh, book uh, Biological... Uh, information, new perspectives, uh, a fascinating chapter.